Hi there, I'm Lori McNee with Fine Art Tips and the 2020 Club about art, social, and tech for the creative entrepreneur. Thanks for joining me. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Annie Strack. Annie is a signature member of 15 artist organizations, including the International Society of Marine Painters and the International Plein Air Painters. She's an expert watercolorist, and watercolor is such an important, popular topic, on my blog especially, that I thought you would enjoy meeting her. She's a professor at the Artist Network University where her painting courses have become some of the most popular classes online. She's the author of The Artist's Guide to Business and Marketing and a feature writer and contributing editor for Professional Artist Magazine. Annie is also an art materials expert and she works with several artist supply companies and reviews their new products. She's gonna give us a lot of tips about products today. She's been published in several prominent magazines, including The Artist Magazine, Watercolor Magazine, The Crafts Report, and Plein Air Magazine. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Let me introduce you to Annie Strack. And so you are a maritime artist, and how did you get into that? I was um, in a very successful co-op gallery, and I was doing a little bit of everything. I was doing you know, the vineyards and the, the I was painting the, the missions and the seascapes and the landscapes. Galleries wanted not somebody who could do a little bit of everything. They wanted a lot of artists, each having a niche. Not that you could do everything. They wanted a, a, a portrait artist and they wanted one that specialized in, in still lifes and they wanted somebody else that specialized in landscapes. They didn't want artists who were all over the place. And there was nobody else in the gallery doing the seascapes. So that's what I went to. And of course you love it because you're from Florida originally, right? I do. So you I do. I really know water. Um, right. When I sit on the beach all the time, every chance I get and just study it. You're um, highly decorated as a watercolorist. And, and I thought we could talk a little bit about watercolor today. And so I've been reading and hearing that watercolor is so popular uh, because people think it's the easiest way to start. I actually think it's rather difficult. Uh, but people don't feel as intimidated by watercolor. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, it is the most popular medium uh, because everybody starts with watercolor. In, in art school, you start with, uh, with drawing and then you move on to watercolor right. before you can move on to acrylic or oils. So everybody has that little bit of background in watercolor. It may have been a long time ago, and it may not have been a big background, but it's something that everybody starts with. So everybody still has a set of watercolors, or they can go anywhere and get them. Even the cheap sets, like um, you know, the play school sets that you buy for your grandkids, you can even paint with those. So can you kind of tell us how to get started with watercolor then? So what would we need? So the first thing you need is a set of watercolors. And, um, you know, like I said, you can start with anything that you get even at the dollar store and just to start with. Those little tins. But, yes, yes, but if you can get to an art supply store or order something online, I recommend this for all mediums. Always buy professional artist grade materials. And here's why. It takes more skill to successfully use the lower quality materials than it does to use the better quality materials. Start with the good stuff, you'll get better results faster. And you won't have that same level of frustration that an artist grade material might give you. And so why do you think that is? Because the pigment isn't as strong? Yes, the pigment won't be as strong. It won't be as intense. Also, there will be fillers. It, right. The color won't match the pigment. So like um, I buy, I use a lot of cobalts in everything. I, it's one of my favorite blues. And cobalt, as you know, is an extremely expensive pigment. It's the most yeah. expensive pigment you can get your hands on right now. In the student grade materials, whether oil or acrylic or watercolor, it doesn't matter. In student grade materials, when you buy a tube of cobalt, it's not going to be cobalt. It's going to be a mixture of lesser expensive pigments such as phthalo and titanium. Um, and, and maybe a little ultramarine mixed together to look like cobalt, but it won't be cobalt. So like cobalt is, um, is a non-staining color, but in a student grade, it is a staining color because it's not cobalt, it's phthalo with other materials mixed in it. 
This oh, is right. my travel palette. It's a well-loved one, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's from Sennelier. It's got a lot of half pans in it. It came with half pans, and I don't like half pans because they're just too small. I can't get the brush in them. So I did um, put add full pans here because they're a little bit, they're an inch long instead of a half inch long. So you could buy those individually then, you're saying? You can. Okay. The, you can buy them um, individually pre-fold pre-filled or if you can buy the empty pans and fill them yourself every art supply store will have pans okay. empty or fold i like the sennelier because they put honey in them just oh, a drop of honey as a binder and the watercolors yeah there's only a few brands that do the honey um traditionally the binder for watercolors is gum arabic which is fine um when you squeeze them out in a pan it, the gum Arabic is, um, it dries out and it gets kind of, cr it cracks and chips and things, you know, kind of like, um, it's like a varnish. It's like a water soluble varnish. So honey, however, will always stay moist. So your watercolors are a little bit easier to use when they're in a pan. And then what else? We need something to paint on. So what kind of paper or, um, you know, there's different pounds, right? You know, hundreds yes. pounds and cold press, hot press, could you kind of help us? So first, how paper is made. Um, the paper is run through a mill, kind of think of it, um, think of a vat. Imagine a wash tub filled with um, lint, you know, this, this lint mixture of paper pulp and water, and it's kind of lumpy like pancake batter. So imagine dipping a window screen into it and then shaking it out like you're panning for gold. Mm -hmm. And then press, laying that down on a layer of felt to dry. Now, if you just let it dry naturally, it's called rough paper and it's got the most texture. Now, rough paper is also extremely absorbent because it's not compressed. It's not been ironed. So it's, it's very absorbent. It's got the most texture, but it's also extremely absorbent. So it soaks in paint, it soaks in water, and it is very difficult to correct mistakes because you cannot lift because it's soaked in. So you can't lift any color out of it. But it gives you that wonderful texture that you can use. I prefer rough paper myself. Oh, do you? Even though it does have that drawback. Mm -hmm. On the opposite end of the spectrum it is hot pressed. Now you lay out that paper. Imagine taking a hot iron, like you're ironing a shirt and ironing that paper with it. Just like ironing a shirt, it makes it stiff and it makes it flatter. It compresses it thinner. That's a great um, analogy. Yes. So it doesn't absorb as much. It, it absorbs very little. The paint set and liquid sets on the surface mm -hmm. and puddles on the surface. So you get very crisp edges. Um, it has no texture. Now it's smooth as glass. So you can get extremely fine detail. It's great for illustration if you want that that photorealism you cannot get that on rough as well but you can certainly get that on a hot press paper okay um and because the paint doesn't soak into it it's very easy to lift with a damp brush and remove paint now i've talked about hot which is the extremely smooth yeah. and the rough which is um no you know very textured the happy medium that most artists use is called coke cold pressed. So imagine now you're ironing that shirt with a hot iron. You know how stiff it gets and how flat it gets. If you iron it with a cold iron, doesn't quite get as smooth. That's what cold pressed paper is. So it's compressed, but without the heat, it doesn't steam out the extra moisture. So it doesn't um, compress quite as thinly as the hot press, it, and it retains a little bit of texture. So it's a little bit the best of both. You have You can lift a little bit, like the hot press, but not as much as the hot press. And it has some texture, but not as much as the rough. So that's why it's the most popular paper. That's a great little tutorial right there. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so then within all those different types of papers, um, textures yes. are weights. For watercolor, you have 140 pound and you have 300 pound. Right. The 300 pound is most popular for artists who use a full sheet. And a full sheet of watercolor paper is 22 by 30 inches. Okay. Um, if you're painting on a full sheet, you want to use 300 pound. Or even if you're doing a half a sheet, you want to mm -hmm. do 300 pound. Anything less than that, it's going to warp because of the size. If you're working small, like um, a quarter sheet, which is 11 by 15, 
you can work on 140. Um, the other alternative is to use blocks. And a block, you know what a notepad is, it's gummed yeah. across the top. Well, a block is gummed on all four sides. So it holds it flat while you're painting and it won't warp. So do you stretch your paper then or no? No, no. because stretching, the word stretching, is actually an old wives' tale. Okay. Um, I was taught to do that. I was I, too, back in high school and college. With yes, 40, yeah. I won't say how long ago. Exactly. But it was a long time ago. We were oh, all oh, taught oh. that. <laughs> we were all taught that. And it's an old wives' tale. <laughs> Don't stretch paper. Okay. I explained how it's made. Mm -hmm. So what, when it comes out, imagine felt. It's made like felt, like a sheet of felt. It is not woven. It is not knitted like a sweater or woven like a shirt. So if you stretch it, you know, you stretch a sweater or a shirt, it's going to bounce back. You stretch felt, it will not. Do not stretch your paper. Oh, good tip. Then. And do not soak it either for that. You know, there used to be, you soak it in a tub. Yes. Remember that? In exactly, the I do. Board. Well, uh, the manufacturers um, put a lot of effort into creating a perfect paper for us with optical brighteners and also adding uh, what's called sizing. Sizing can be gelatin or it can, you know, which is animal based, or it can be a starch, which is vegetable based. Either one, those, the sizing is what makes the paper stiff and what keeps everything from soaking into it. You know, if you didn't do sizing, it would be like a paper towel. It would just absorb everything. And if you soak it, you remove that sizing and ruin the paper. Okay, good tip. Okay, then brushes. We need something. Now we've got Whoa. the paint and the paper. And then, so what's next? Well, um, in my opinion, everyone needs a good round and a good flat. Okay. And do you and have those handy? You could explain the difference. I do. My <laughs> brushes. I love my brushes. Oh, I know. And watercolor brushes, they're really special. They are special. They're expensive. Now, you yes, can buy, again, you can buy cheap brushes, but splurge. Everyone should splurge and have at least one good sable. Can you find sable brushes anymore though? Because yes, because I've heard that um, being real fur that they're not on the market anymore. So, but you still can't, correct? There, there was a, um, and something going on with Kolinsky's a while back. There are some, some fur that is Endangered that you yes. cannot get uh, mongoose, which as yeah. an oil painter you probably used used right. to use mongoose, yeah. but you can't anymore. But there's some really good synthetics. Yes, the there are, and I've moved to synthetics um, as yeah. I've become more educated on the whole thing. These are squirrel brushes. It's from Raphael, and this is also a Raphael. Oh, that helps, yeah. And um, these are dry at the moment. This is a natural squirrel hair. And this is a new brush that they just started making a couple of years ago. This is a synthetic squirrel. Okay. They kind of look the same. However, um, you know, the old synthetic brushes didn't hold much liquid. The thing with the natural hair brushes, they hold more liquid. With watercolor, how much liquid it holds is very important. You want a brush that holds a lot of liquid. A brush that holds a lot of liquid gives you a longer stroke before you pick it up off the paper and have to reload it. A synthetic brush, you will find yourself going dab, 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 and constantly reloading the brush because it doesn't hold as much. So it's very hard to get that long, confident brush stroke with a synthetic brush that you get with, with a natural hair brush. And that causes more splotchiness too on the paper, doesn't it? Yes, yes, yes. You see how it bellies out at, yeah. the, at the bottom, at the ferrule? A synthetic brush won't belly out. It'll stay smooth. This is a synthetic. Okay. A very good synthetic, though. I really like this synthetic. But you see how it, it doesn't belly out? It's yes, I do. And I'm dipping in water, shaking out the excess. And it still is straight. It's not bellied out. It doesn't have that teardrop shape. Right meaning that it didn't really absorb a lot of water. This is a uh, Kolinsky sable, very expensive. Yes. And it bellied yeah, out. It created a teardrop shape, showing that. that it holds a lot more liquid. Yes. And then when you clean them after a painting session, is it just in the water then? Just in the water. It doesn't need anything else. Now, if they do lose their shape, you know how when you buy a brand new brush, it's got that stiffness to it? Yeah fabric starch. Okay. 
So if your brush, you know, gets all um, oh, that's a great tip. You know that funny, you know that that yeah. bad shape to all the hairspray. <laughs> Dip it in fabric starch and okay. um, and reshape it, and then let it dry. I'm going to show you something. This is the synthetic squirrel. Oh, that has a bit of a belly, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. And um, and watch, this is new. It performs. Oh, that's a nice one. Yes. That's exciting. So um, there's, this is uh, Raphael, but there's actually several other manufacturers have started doing this. They just started doing this about two, maybe three years ago. This is a fairly new technology. So the reason why um, synthetic brushes were never absorbent is because the hairs were too straight. They don't, um, they don't, they're just too straight. So there's no variation you mean the individual hair doesn't the individual hairs right. Right. right a natural hair has um even our our own natural hair yeah. you know it does frizz and that's what these do i mean it will they're not always the perfect same length or they have variations in diameter and their surfaces are not smooth and what um what this brush what these new brushes have these new synthetic squirrels at a microscopic level, they kink the hair. Okay. And you can't see it at a microscopic level, but imagine like a honeycomb beehive. So when all the hairs go together, it's got that effect and the moisture is in between those hairs then. And it, You're a font it, of knowledge, that's great. Okay, so those are your rounds then, basically. Yes, I um, must have, a, I, I, I do require all my students have a squirrel. Okay. So a squirrel and is a must. A squirrel okay. is a must. This is a number four. My other one's a number five. Okay. And the sizing on squirrels, also called a mop or a quill. Yeah. The reason it's called a quill is this part right here. This was originally quilled feather quills oh. that it was wrapped in. And the reason is squirrel, squirrel hair is very delicate. So they can't really, it's very difficult for them to use a metal ferrule because it would just break the, hurl, the squirrels. Um, so they use a quill. It's also called a mop. And then the other brush everyone needs is a flat. Okay, so the squirrels are the mops and the rounds, yes. um, the difference between those is what the, the what it's made out of then? Yes, I um, pretty much only use natural hair because they just absorb so much more fluid. <laughs> so I don't have to re-dip and reload the brush as often. <laughs> let, let me show you the flat brush now. Um, I also use a flat brush and I use this a lot as well. This is a one inch flat. I recommend everybody get a one inch flat. Um, big broad washes, but also I use this for lifting. This is a synthetic. This is um, from Dynasty Brush. Now, it gets a nice sharp point on it. So I can use that to lift um, on like, lines when okay. I'm painting the seascape, get that lightness in it, or I can lift out trees in a landscape. And then do you um, use like a uh, paper towel or something once, once you lift and then- Yeah, you... lift and blot. Okay. So when a teacher says wet on wet, that means a wet brush or wet on dry. Okay. A wet brush, I'm gonna dip this in my water again, shake it out. Okay. Wasn't quite wet enough, but yeah, and this is, a any kind of brush, it will snap back. Now, if, it, if a teacher says, oh, you want you to use a dry brush technique, so I'm gonna squeeze a little bit of the water out. The brush is damp, it's not really dry dry, but when I pull the bristles apart, they stay spread. That's the difference between a dry brush and a wet brush. And that goes for a round brush or a flat brush, squirrel, sable, synthetic, it's all the same. You can use that for different effects, obviously, like if you want to just sure. and that sort of thing. Yes, if um, I, you know, wet on wet, you want to use for even washes. Okay. But a dry brush technique, you get um, a little bit more detail, but also just very carefully rub the brush across and let the texture of the paper pull it off. But, and, and this goes for every, every medium, oil, acrylic, watercolor. Whatever brush you instinctively pick up, put it back. Take the next larger size. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Yep. If you get too small, you get too wimpy with your paintings. That's yeah. true. Like with this great big um, one-inch flat, yeah. 
you know, I can paint a whole painting with this, even a small painting, just by using the edges and the corners. Yeah. yeah. So you are a product expert. And um, I am. You were telling me a bit ago that you have worked with companies. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, I worked with Royal Talents for a while, which is a company that you work with. That, that's who um, I'm with. Yes. Um, but I was a product demonstrator. I would go to the stores and demonstrate the products in the store. You know how you go to Costco and there's that lady with the uh, yes. food samples? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay, imagine that in an art supply store. That's me with the art oh, supply. Oh, yeah, that's fun. Trying to get you, you, showing you how it's made, how, um, telling yeah, you how yeah. great it is, and trying to get you to sample it. Right, and I do that for with them for Cobra. I'll go to trade shows and I'll be the the booth babe, right? But yeah, the booth <laughs> babe. That's that. That's, that's it. the same yeah. thing. And yeah. uh, but I kind of call it boots on the ground, and I think it's important, and I enjoy it. Then after Royal Talents, I'm currently with um, Chart Pack. The Chart Pack is a great big company. They own Grumbacher and Schmincke and Molito, a Mission Gold, yes. um, Higgins Inc., Pelican Inc. They own about two dozen different label for someone that's just wanting to get started and you know they want to paint at their kitchen table they don't have a real studio don't want to invest too much in art supplies so three brushes a, a tin of watercolor and yep. then what do you suggest then maybe a sketchbook or um, a sketchbook oh. is a good idea okay. um but if you're going to paint in watercolor make sure it's a watercolor sketchbook and not a multi-purpose sketchbook okay because like i said the multimedia sketchbooks um, are great for drawing and colored pencils and markers, not so great for a lot of water. They're a little bit too lightweight. So invest in a sketchbook. This is um, about 140 pound paper. And it, this one has an ivory tone to it, which I kind of like. I didn't think I was gonna like it when they sent it to me, but I like it because sometimes I'll use a white pen a white gel pen oh i was going to ask about white next yes i yes. don't normally use white but with a colored sketchbook i do and it was gouache you use gouache don't I you i do i love gouache yeah great Mitch, on colored paper gouache please well since we just touched on that the Ooh, sure gouache. so gouache people think that watercolor gouache is watercolor and eh, not quite gouache is gouache it's a completely different medium it is very similar to uh, what we used as children called poster paints in that it's a very thick paint. It is water soluble um, and water mixable, um, but it dries, it's opaque. It has um, the, a lot more opacity to it, so you can cover. Watercolor, they are very transparent. Even the ones labeled opaque, you can still see through them like um, Chinese white or titanium white in mm -hmm. watercolor you will not cover. Mm -hmm. You can always see what's underneath it. With gouache, it is opaque, and when you layer things on, you can't see through them. So right. you use gouache very much like you would use oil or acrylic paint. Yeah, I start uh, like a traditional watercolor, at least I do when I start, kind of thin and transparent, and then I build it up. And so I think it's more forgiving than a traditional watercolor. So, yes. Yeah. yeah, it is fun too because fun. because you can correct your mistakes much easier. Yeah. Um, but you get and you get that effect. It's it's going to be a flat. It's not going to be shiny like an acrylic or an oil because it doesn't have that um, oil in it. Right. That that yeah. shiny medium in it. So it is going to always be a flat surface, um, non-reflective paint. But it is going to work a lot like oils and acrylic. Yeah. But because it's water soluble, it's a lot easier to clean up. So when you start painting, do you use a pencil to kind of sketch underneath? I you do, can... I okay. do. Now with oils and acrylic, I don't. I draw with the brush. Mm -hmm. I do too. Um, and I usually do an underpainting and then glaze over it. Now with watercolor, uh, it's, it's unforgiving. Everything is transparent and translucent, so any, everything you do is permanent. Every brush stroke is permanent. So you don't want to make too many brush strokes because you can never remove them, you can never cover them up. And for that reason, you have to do a very detailed drawing first. With watercolor, it's light to dark, and then generally, I mean, sort yes. of, with, with oils, it's more dark to light, you know. Exactly. Powers, but. But it is um, opposite technique 
in many ways. Do you do your best to retain your lights um, and use the paper as your white? I do. do. You do? Do you? I, I, I know you said the gel pen. You use yes, well, I do that in my sketchbook. I don't do that on painting so okay. much because um, a lot, I enter a lot of jury shows. Yeah. And in the watercolor societies, um, opaque is not allowed. Yeah, they're very and the gel pen is that. opaque. Yes. So I yeah. don't use it. I use it in a sketchbook. It's great for studies and uh -huh. for sketches, but not for anything else. Okay. Um, so I use masking fluid. This is um, the Winsor Newton masking fluid. Lots of different brands. This one has a slightly yellow tint. You'll notice it's not really white. And the reason I like the tinted ones is because I'm old. I can't see that well. <laughs> and if I use the white ones, I can't see where I'm doing it. So you do this at the beginning, like you've done your drawing. Yep. And then have to pre-plan where you want those lights to stay. Yes, and all the whites and anything that's light, yes. I'll go and mask out. And it's kind of a gummy, I haven't used it in years, and then it, you just kind of rub it off, correct? Yes, Once it's actually dry. rubber. Okay. It's a liquid latex, yeah, um, imagine a latex glove. So if you dipped your hand in it, you would have a, a latex glove. Oh. If you want to cover something with white, you really need to use white gouache. Okay, so back to gouache then. A lot of people that I know say, oh, just get a little tiny watercolor set and grab a white gouache and you can turn your watercolor into gouache. I have yes. found that totally to work quite as well, but... Not at, right, it won't work quite as well because you will lighten your colors. Yes, that's extent. what I've noticed. You, you will lose intensity. Yes, but it's a quick way if you want to give it a try, kind of get the gouache feel just by the white and you can add it to your watercolor set. Well, any last little tips for us? Well, I wanna talk a minute about the split primary process. Oh, yes. When you buy, you know, I have all of these watercolors. I don't use every color in this pan. Yes, exactly. um, I carry them with me because I never know when I might need them, but I've got like eight or nine just blues. I really don't need that many. What you really need to start out with anything is what's called a split primary palette. Okay. A warm and a cool of each of the primary colors. And as you know, the primaries are yellow, blue, and red. And with those, you know, if you have those, that will give you, um, you know, three primaries equals three secondaries, and then your, your third colors. Yeah, tertiary. On and on. <laughs> but if you double that, if you have a warm and a cool of each of a red and a yellow and a blue, you then double it and you can mix every color you possibly need. That's so, what I do in my studio. Um, I use the split primary palette um, in oil. Yes, and I do too in oil. And I do find in oil in the field, like when I'm teaching, I think that that becomes too many for the beginner, um, for an oil painter that's just starting out. Sometimes they end up mixing, they're not as harmonious. Cool and warm. So you can see the different colors that you can achieve with the just six tubes of paint. Nice. And I like it, especially, this is what I use, this is watercolor, but I use the split primary when I use, when I go oil painting because I do a lot of the plein air. And the less I have to carry, the, you know, the further I can walk. So I only carry, I carry the six tubes plus, plus white. Well, great. Well, goodness, thank you so much, Annie. Really appreciate your time here. And, uh, and quickly, are you using Twitter much anymore? That's where we originally met. I am. Yes, oh, that's where we originally met. And uh, you're still writing some? Um, I am. I am. So right now when I write, I do write tutorials and things like that. And I post them, I give them away. Um, Hanamala puts them on their blog and different companies that I work with will post those tutorials then. Well, great. So where else can we find you? Gosh, well, I'm on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and, um, and your website is and my website and my website and, and, and I do teach. Annie I do Strack. travel around. And teach. Oh, tell us your website. You're on. Oh, AnnieStrackArt.com. I, like I said, I do the store demos. Um, going around to the different stores and demoing, but not at the moment, of course. And then I also travel around and I teach. Um, I am going to Sennelier next summer. I was supposed to go this summer, Wonderful. next summer. I know all of our plans have been postponed or canceled. It's a really interesting time. So 
I really appreciate your time here on Zoom and thank you so much. And I'll look forward to sharing all this information with my following and I'd love to have you back and love to get a demo from you. So that oh, I will. That'll be next. Okay. Well, thanks, Annie. And thanks, thank Lori. You. Thank you for joining us at the 2020 Club where art, social, and tech meet. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks, Lori. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.